Good evening, everybody. You turn to Psalm 47. talk tonight about an inheritance and in Psalm 47 it's, uh, at, at first reading there doesn't seem much to the psalm and as you uh, study a little bit more closely uh, there's a whole lot to the psalm and in the beginning of verse 1 well clap your hands all you people shout unto God with the voice of triumph for the Lord most high is terrible he's a great king over all the earth he shall subdue the people under us and the nation under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sing ye praises with understanding. God reigns over the heathen, God sits upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. Um, I want a couple just uh, preliminary thoughts. One is uh, right out of the bat there, it says the Lord most high is terrible. Uh, that word there for, is a Hebrew word meaning fearsome, dreadful, stand in awe. Uh, it says uh, this God that uh, of the Scripture is 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 a terrible God, is a terrifying God. He's uh, he has all power, all might. Uh, he he does whatever whatsoever he pleases in heaven and earth, and um, that's a different notion of God than you know most people have in the world. Most people have in the world, particularly in the Western world, uh, but God is a sort of somewhat of a pitiful creature. Uh, wants to do things, can't get it done, wishes you'd do something, but you won't. Uh, just a poor, pathetic thing. Uh, you know, it's so right off the bat, this is a different picture of God in Psalms. Uh, he's a great king over all the earth and uh, most high and terrible. Secondly, he's going to subdue the people. And I'm going to spiritualize that just a little bit in verse 3. He shall subdue the people under us, the nations under our feet. The Jews, now this is written in, in Psalms, so we're talking back in the times of David. The Jews never subdued all nations. So it's not really speaking physically that the Jews would uh, rule the world. Uh, but rather, if, uh, uh, you need to obviously spiritualize this. What he's talking about is that the gospel that's going to come out from his people is going to, is going to call people from all nations. That all the nations are going to be sub subdued uh, under uh, under the gospel sound, and that people from all over, you know, all over nation, all nations and creeds and colors, are going to come to hear this gospel. People from all those nations. Now, does that mean that that uh, that God loves uh, every person of all time? Uh, no, but it's in John three sixteen. It says, "For God so loved the world, uh, or the nations, that He gave His only begotten Son." And the meaning in that of that particular verse is that God. The, the gospel was going to extend outside of the just the nation of Israel to the entire world, and people from all over the world, God would call them by by that by that gospel sound, and so here he's, he uh, he says uh, he's going to subdue the people, the nations under our feet. In fact, in, in Isaiah, turn to Isaiah forty-two quickly, if you would. Psalms, uh, Proverbs, on to Isaiah. In Isaiah 42, in verse 5, it says, uh, Thus saith the Lord God that created the heavens and stretched them out. He that spread forth the earth and that which comes out of it. He that gives breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. Now this is the Father talking to the Son. And will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people and a light of the Gentiles. That particular verse in the Old Testament would have been very upsetting to the Jews because they felt like they were the one and only and this, this gospel would never go outside of their world. 
But this Savior, this Messiah that was to come, this prophesied here, is going to be a light to the Gentiles. And so the same thing back here in, in, the, in Psalms where it says, uh, he'll subdue the people of the nations under our feet, that, that this gospel message is going to go out and uh, God is going to call his people and they're going to come and worship, worship him uh, after hearing that gospel. The third verse is what I really want to focus on and I won't go much beyond the third verse. And where it says, he shall choose our inheritance for us. Now, a uh, couple things about that. First of all, uh, those that uh, are to receive an inheritance are referred to as heirs. You know, I, I, I was an heir to my mother's estate, which was not much. Mary was an heir to her father's estate. Uh, you, can't, you can't make yourself an heir. You know, uh, you can't do it. That doesn't mean someone else can't make you an heir if they decide to, uh, for example, if I adopt a child and I decide to make them an heir, I'm, I, it's my choice to make them an heir. But an heir, you can't, so if, if, we, could, if we could choose who we'd be heirs to, I'd, I'd be calling Jeff Bezos and, and signing up. You know, I'll be an heir right there. That, that'll work for me just fine. And Bill Gates and, you know, you can go on and on with the list of the super wealthy of our world. But we can't make ourselves an heir. And we can't determine our inheritance because we, because we can't make ourselves we can't make ourselves heirs. So, um, but this this verse here, so heirship is not created by choice. It's a, it's a matter of uh, a familial issue, uh, and an an heir is actually a person that's legally entitled to the property or rank of another on that person's death. And um, the interesting thing about this verse is that it, it pleases God to make some heirs. By his choice because he says he shall choose our inheritance for us turn to Titus chapter 3 I'm gonna go through four verses here I want to make this point that God makes heirs of those whom he will in Titus and we're going to go to about four New Testament passages here. Okay, in Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> I'll start with verse, verse 5. It's not what I want to focus on, but just to get the theme here. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made, should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So I wanna I'm gonna tie this to a few other passages that it pleases God to make heirs out of certain people. They can't choose it themselves, but he, as it says here in Psalms. 47 he will choose them to be heirs and we see that you know we, we see that here being justified by his grace we should be made an heir that's an outside force working on us turn to Colossians chapter 1 Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Chapter 1 and verse 12 <coughs> says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us, made us, meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So we see again that there is this action of God toward a people to make them heirs. This action of God to to give them or choose an inheritance for certain people. Turn to James chapter 2. <clears throat> to give you a little insight into who God has chosen to be heirs. God gives us his insight because it's not their choosing. It's obvious. Look at this in James chapter 2 and verse 5. It says, 
Hearken, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the heirs of the kingdom which He promised to them that love Him? So uh, we see we see again this. Uh, you know, God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Now that faith is not of their own; it's a faith He imparts to them. But it's the point I'm making here is that. Uh, uh, you know those that he's he's made them meet to be partakers of the inheritance inheritance he, uh, that they should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life has God not chosen the poor of this world to be heirs of the kingdom and and uh, one last verse on this point turn to Ephesians in chapter one. This is a chapter that most religions would love to cut out of the Bible. It's very disturbing to modern religion. <clears throat> Speaking of believers in verse 11, he says, in whom, that's in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And so, uh, and if you go up to uh, uh, verse uh, verse 4 of this let's begin in verse 3 of Ephesians 1 blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself that's why I'm an heir I'm adopted I'm an adopted and not only am I, and you know, I've never, I, I've not hang, hung around adoption agencies very much, but I know this much. The adopt, the children don't choose their parents. They don't. And, and we see here, we were predestinated, un, predestinated us, it says. What does that mean? In verse 3, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. This is a working of God on a people that he had known before time began before, that, uh, that he was going to place his love upon them and make them heirs that the, the, the race was going to fall on Adam fall to a point where there was they were utterly hopeless and yet he was going to by the sound of the gospel reach out and redeem those that he had placed his love on before time began those that were predestinated under that adoption and that's to the praise of his glory and grace and mercy. Now, the question I ask is, uh, how does God change one to, to be an heir? How do you go from, I'm not an heir, I'm just a, a, a wild seed out there doing whatever. How does God make one an heir? Turn to Acts chapter 20. How does God do this? How does he communicate this to these people? How do they become aware of this? that God has a message for them. In Acts chapter 20, in verse 32, it says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. He, by the word, the gospel preaching, is pleased to communicate to, to men, sinful men, that all that's necessary for salvation and has been done in Christ. All of his blood as a sacrifice for their sins, Christ's righteousness, righteousness placed upon them, uh, that's the word of his grace. And the, 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 like, on the, like uh, Pastor Chuck was reading, just like that sinner on the cross, coming to the realization, I'm out I, without, in my current state, I am without hope. And seeing and looking at the, at the face of Christ and saying, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. You know, unworthy as I am, suited and well suited for the damnation that's coming my direction. Father, would you remember me? Turn to uh, Acts chapter one, so as long as we're in Acts,
Well, you know what? I think I have the wrong citation on this, but it's, uh, I've read this many times. I can't remember which book it's in. Uh, it says, In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. I think that's Col maybe Colossians 1.13. Uh, uh, I won't search around now, but he goes, uh, You were sealed by the Holy Spirit of the promise after you heard the word of truth, which is the earnest of our inheritance. There's a down payment to this inheritance. The believers know that inheritance is coming because the Spirit of God takes up residence in them. You know, I said, you know, Chuck used the word occupy today, and that's what God does by the preaching of the gospel. He, he, he will, in communicating that message to believers, once he, he uh, for those that he has given ears to hear. He takes up residence, or he occupies, occupies their mind, occupies their heart to believe this gospel. So one last uh, important verse, and, and my question is, what's the cause of heirship, and what are we heirs to? So 1 Peter, and we'll, we'll camp on this one for a little while. 1 Peter uh, says some very important things about this inheritance. It's extremely important. In verse Peter in verse chapter one and verse three it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last times. So if you want to know the cause of how one becomes an heir, the cause is right there in front of you. Abundant mercy. Undeserved mercy is an undeserved favor. Nothing that the person did, nothing that could have made them an heir, but by the gratuitous action of God through the sound of the gospel uh, and, and the, the spirit of God uh, replacing a stony heart with a soft one to hear and believe on the work of the Lord Christ that when he died he died for them uh, that's abundant mercy it says what's the inheritance what's the description of the inheritance it's incorruptible that means it's it's there's no tint of death in it it doesn't decay it's undefiled means that there's no stain of human nature to it it's perfect um, I read a quote from an old uh, reformer that I thought was kind of interesting I didn't like it too much as a businessman, but it's certainly true. Uh, the quote was, the rich man is either a dishonest man himself or the heir of a dishonest man. And I thought, well, given the nature of man, I can't argue with that. But for God's riches, they're undefiled. They're, they're, not, they're not tainted in any way. It's, it's perfect. Um, it fades not away. It's not, it's not going to deteriorate. It's not going to wither. The distinction there is against you know beautiful flowers. It's beautiful for a day, uh, but it uh, it withers and dies. It's reserved in heaven. And that means it's out of the reach of danger. It's certain. Whatever Satan may want to uh, uh, to do, or however uh, he may want to uh, knock us off uh, a good path, it's it's this inheritance is reserved in heaven. It's beyond the reach of danger. So therefore, it's certain. And it says it's, uh, and just to encourage you, it says it's undefiled, face not away, it's reserved in heaven for you. For you. Encouragement to believers. Now, some would say, uh, well, it's great that there's an inheritance reserved in heaven, but I'm going through a difficult time right here now. What does it do for me now? He goes on in the next thing. Well, you're kept by the power of God through faith. Who are you who are kept by the power of God. He's there moment to moment, each and every minute of your life, uh, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last in the last time. That word there, by the way, who are kept by the power of God, uh, it, it expresses a, a fixed and abiding state, meaning it, it, 
it, it has been and will be. Um, turning to uh, the last thought that I was uh, wanting to hit on. So, so that was a description of the inheritance, the cause of that inheritance, abundant mercy. A description of that inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, it's reserved for you. So what is the inheritance? What is it? You know, I know what it is with Jeff Bezos. It's a bunch of stock. It's money. It's this. That'll fade away. That'll die. That won't last. Whoever gets it's going to spend it, use it, waste it. Uh, no matter what it is, it's going to fade. Uh, but uh, turn to uh, Romans chapter 8. I've got four verses on this. And then we'll close. But Romans chapter 8. I want to make the argument the inheritance the essence of the inheritance the most important part of the inheritance is Christ himself in Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 it says he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall we not with him also freely give us all things everything that's Christ's is your inheritance including him and that where it says how shall uh, with him also freely give us all things you remember pastor Warner uh, spoke of that in the Greek it means the everything how shall he not give us the everything there's nothing nothing held back nothing to, nothing kept from his people so everything that the son has his people have turn to uh, Lamentations chapter 3 we'll go to Lamentations and then Psalms um, I've left, I've left the message here, uh, the uh, citation there for you. So let me just tell you, it says, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore, I'll hope in him. The Lord is our inheritance. He's my portion. That word for portion there in Lamentation 3.24, the Lord is my portion, that's the same word as inheritance. The Lord's my inheritance. Uh, turn, to, t turn to Psalm that's a, a 73. We'll see the same thought. Again, it's throughout the scripture. What is this inheritance that's waiting? It's, it's eternal felicity with Christ. Jesus said, you know, I, 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 um, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. He goes, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And that's the inheritance that we love. That's what we want. That where I am, there you may be also. It doesn't get better than that. Uh, in Psalm 73, in verse 26, it says, My flesh and my heart fails, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion and my inheritance. That word there for portions is the same Hebrew word as inheritance. It's my inheritance forever. Um, turn to Numbers 18, and then I'll close on this thought. The priests in the Old Testament, in Numbers, uh, they had a particular uh, rule. Uh, the, the, the law made a, a situation for the, all those that serve the Lord. And you know, in type, we're all priests and kings, it says in the revelations of our God. He's made those who believe this gospel, he says they're, they're, they're a kingdom of, uh, uh, they're kings and priests unto their God. And so we see as in the priesthood of the Old Testament, we see an analogy in, in Numbers 18, in verse 20, it says, Then the Lord said to Aaron, who was, the high, who was the priest, he said, You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. So the inheritance of the priests was the Lord himself. That's what their inheritance was, and that's the, the inheritance of the believer. That's not an inheritance the world really cares about. Just they have no interest. They have no interest. The inheritance that, that excites the believer, that when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I'm at, you're going to be also, that excites the believer. It won't excite the world. But it's, it's, a, it's an incorruptible, undefiled, reserved in heaven. It's all that the, the, all the believers desire. So, in sum, the inheritance intended for us, designed to be ours, namely, is God himself. He's the portion of his people, uh, and uh, all uh, all their desire. So uh, the, the fifth point, and, uh, and then we'll go to a use, back to uh, verse 3 there. 
<clears throat> verse 4, he shall choose our inheritance for us. The excellency of Jacob, whom he loved. And um, where it says the excellency of Jacob, that word excellency here is the, it's the boast of Jacob. It's the boast of his people. There's, and turn uh, in 1 Corinthians, don't turn there. 1 Corinthians 131, it says, he that glorieth or he that boasts, let him glory in the Lord. And this, this, uh, this thought, this word that's laid out here, and God will choose our inheritance and for us, that excites a believer. That's a boast to a believer. Because the opposite of that is to boast on yourself. To say, I'll save myself. I'll make my choice. God's waiting for me to do this. I'll make a prayer and God will be okay. Because if I don't make my prayer, you know, then nothing, you know, I'll, I'll behave a certain way. Uh, I'll go to church on Sunday. I'll do this. I'll do that. And then God will have to accept me. Boasting on yourself. That's your brag. But the excellency or the boast of the believers is what? That he chose our inheritance for us. He made us heirs. He adopted us into the family. for no good reason except abundant mercy. Abundant mercy. So, the use then for this is uh, that if you be Christ, you are made an heir. And uh, you're an heir according to the promise. And if you're an heir, um, turn to uh, turn to Ephesians, if you would, for a last uh, verse here. Back to Ephesians chapter one. And if you're an heir, you know, while we're we're turning there to Ephesians one, it just always amazes me, and it must be in the Old Testament a half a dozen times, and I've repeated a half a million times. But the Old Testament says salvation is of the Lord. And so it is. Uh, that salvation is, is God reaching to men, touching them through the gospel preaching, making them an heir. They're made, made, uh, made to receive this inheritance, not by their deserving, but by abundant mercy. In Ephesians 1.18, it says, May it be that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. May it be that you understand the full depth and scope and rich, the, the breadth, the depth, the width of this inheritance that's coming your way. For believers, the down payment is made. It's the Spirit of God that opens up the word that makes them see. Just like that thief on the, uh, that thief on the cross, wow, what do I see? I see myself crystal clear. And I see Christ crystal clear. Perfect, holy, undefiled. My hope rests solely on his blood, his sacrifice on behalf of paying for my sin. Not that I deserved it in any way, shape, or form. And not that God's duty bound to save me or anybody else. God would be perfectly right to let every man, woman, and child go to hell. He would be perfectly right. That's what the fall of Adam brought. Most men don't believe that. <laughs> Scripture is clear about it. But there's such great hope today that God says... By the, by the sound of the gospel, going back to uh, uh, Acts, he says, uh, uh, by the, I commend you to the word of his grace. That is the gospel preaching. He, gives, he, he imparts inheritance, imparts belief, uh, and uh, imparts great hope to those uh, that he's calling through the gospel. Pastor Chuck, would you close us in a word of prayer?